We're going to finish up the series called The Unseen, and it's been powerful. If you've been here with us for the last couple of weeks, um, last week we had Pastor Damien with us, Pastor Damien Bassett from Hillsong, Toronto. The week before, we had Pastor Mia launch the series, which was powerful. I'm going to wrap it up today, although it never really ends. We'll just continue with this. But we're talking about that which is unseen. The, the things that we can't see perhaps with our physical eyes, we don't see it or we don't feel it, but it's real. We know that God operates in the unseen and that while we see things happening around us, while we can see God moving in some capacity, we know that what he's doing is way bigger, way broader than what we can see. And what we're called to do as Jesus people, as followers of Christ, is to focus our attention on what we can't see, which sounds ridiculous, but that's what we're asked to do, to look at what we can't see. That's what faith is. Our key scripture for this series has been 2 Corinthians 4, 18, which says this, so we fix our eyes not on what is seen, but on what is unseen, since what is seen is temporary, but what is unseen is eternal. The Mirror Study Bible says it this way. It says, we are not keeping any score of what seems so obvious to the senses on the surface. It is fleeting and irrelevant. It is the unseen eternal realm within us which has our full attention and captivates our gaze. It's the unseen eternal realm within us that we're focused on. It has our attention. And Relate Church, this is who we are. We're a people that, yeah, we, we could get distracted by all that is seen, by all the noise that we're surrounded by. We could be focusing on what seems to be darker and darker in the world around us. We could tune in to the, the arguments and the, the criticisms that we're surrounded with. We could, but we are a family. We're a church that chooses to focus on what is unseen. We choose to look at what God is doing, and that's especially what we're going to do in this season. We are, and this scripture kind of lays it out, that we're actually looking at what God is doing on the inside of us because we know that God is moving. We know that revival is here. We see how God is doing something pretty amazing and, and something unlike what he's ever done before in the world and specifically in our city and we're excited about it. But we know that revival doesn't just kind of happen out there. It always happens within. It starts in us. And God is focused on the unseen and God is specifically focused on the unseen that is in us. We know this. We had this conversation recently, and I'll just throw this out to you. Have you ever considered which superpower you would choose if you could pick one? Have you ever thought about that? It's like a, one of those um, conversation starters, icebreakers sometimes. We talked about it as a family. Like, if you could choose a superpower, what would you pick? You could choose, what would you pick? What? Time travel, yes. Okay, time travel. Uh, you, could, you could pick um, flying, I don't know, sticky web shooting. <laughs> Let's think of all the superheroes. Super strength, invisibility. Um, there's the, the mom in The Incredibles. Uh, she's stretchy. Yeah, that's a fun one. <laughs> we were talking about it, and I feel like and this is just indicative of my personality. If I had to pick one, I'd either choose invisibility because I'm just snoopy that way. I'd like to be able to be in a room and know what's going on. Maybe I don't want to know. Maybe it would be better if I didn't. But it would be interesting and fascinating to me to be invisible and to, now you're all so creeped out, to know what's happening <laughs> when you can't see me. Or the whole idea of like reading minds mind reading. I'm, I'm very interested in, in that idea because don't you think it would just be so helpful to know what's really going on in people's minds? Or, yeah, maybe I don't really want to know. Uh, but if it's your superpower, you can choose, right? Maybe I could choose when I want to turn it on and when I don't. Or maybe really what I, I want is to be able to know what's in people's hearts. I just think that would be really helpful to know what's really going on 
in somebody's heart. And God knows, the Bible tells us God knows, and in fact, that's where he's focused, on, on the inner man or woman, on the heart. That while we, as humanity, tend to look at what people do, we look at what, what's happening on, on someone's face, or we listen to the words, God shoots past that with, with his focus, and he looks at the heart. He's interested in the heart. And of course, like, we know that what's on the inside of somebody will eventually come out. We know that if, if there's a mess on the inside, it's eventually gonna, gonna show, it's gonna come out of our words. Uh, Matthew 12, 33 paints this picture of a good tree that produces good fruit and a bad tree that produces bad fruit. And it says that we know what's on the inside by what comes out of the mouth. And you know this is true. If there's bitterness on the inside of you, you can hide it for a while, you can push it down, you can, you can cope, but eventually that thing is going to come out of your mouth. We know that eventually it shows, but we also know that God is paying attention to what goes on on the inside. It's no wonder that that's where he focuses. We see this in the life of David, 1 Samuel 16, 7, where God chooses David because of his heart. And we, we read here, the Lord doesn't see things the way that we see them. People judge by outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. God isn't focused so much on what you do as who you are. He isn't focused so much on what you do. He's focused on who you are. And we know that God is moving and revival is here and God is doing a new thing. I posted that last night. God is doing a new thing as I was sharing news of uh, this, this new meeting space in Abbotsford and a few people responded and said, it's a new thing. So yes, God is doing a new thing. Um, if you didn't grow up in church, that just went way over your head. But God is moving and, and we, we desperately need him to. And we know that his desire is to heal our land, to bring healing to this broken world. And that's what we want. We can see how badly our land needs healing. Second Chronicles 7.14 tells us, If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and I will forgive their sin and I will heal their land. That's what we want, isn't it, church? Yeah, yeah. Isn't that our, our heart, that God would heal this, this dark and broken land, which just seems more confusing by the day. Um, and yet, our work is to prepare ourselves. Our work is to prepare space, to prepare ground, so that the healing, so that the revival, the renewal uh, comes from us, comes in us and through us. God chooses when and how and where and through whom he will work. Our responsibility and our job is to prepare so he can do the thing that he has prepared to do. Uh, corporate revival, which is what we're praying for, it always starts with a personal revival. Yeah. And here's what I want to encourage you in today. We've said this a few times, but I want to remind you that it's the spirit that does the heavy lifting. It's the spirit that does the work. God is strong and he's powerful and he's able and we so often feel weak and yet we allow space for him to do the work within us. And, and, and yet we, we tend to see our lives as like a, a linear path, if you will. This is how we look at ourselves. We think that we kind of start out perhaps fresh and new and, and maybe a little bit ignorant and we don't know much. And we see ourselves as needing to like learn and grow and, and, and perhaps experience some success or breakthrough from God. And then we think if, if that happens in our life, we'll grow in strength and we'll continue and, and life just gets better and better and brighter and brighter. We tend to think just with life in general that it's like this path where we're supposed to obviously we're we're kids that's how we start out and then we're supposed to experience I don't know love perhaps and marriage and a certain amount of kids and a, a marriage that never breaks up and just a, a growing wisdom and a flourishing old age that's how we tend to see it 
And if life doesn't happen this way, or if we don't experience um, constant breakthroughs and growing and just more wisdom and better and better, we feel discouraged. We tend to see failure if at any point on this linear line something doesn't go the way that we thought it would. We find ourselves disappointed in the path, or we feel like we've messed up and, and we're just going to stop here. And can I say this, that the enemy would love it if you'd just stop because you read failure along this path. And today, rather than looking at our lives as a linear path, I mean it is, life is a journey, but when we look at how God works, and we're going to look at a specific example today, we see that he works actually in cycles, that he's always working, that when it doesn't seem obvious, perhaps in seasons where it looks like nothing good is happening, and in fact there's failure or there's loss, that in God, because of how God works, actually there's great growth and there's amazing things happening. And God is the only one who's able to do this. God works in systems. He works in cycles. I want to look today at Psalm ver chapter 1, verse 1. Actually, the whole chapter. It's a short one. This was my Opa's favorite chapter. And he lived this life. And it says, Psalm 1, starting in verse 1. Oh, the joys of those who do not follow the advice of the wicked or stand around with sinners or join in with mockers. But they delight in the law of the Lord, meditating on it day and night. They are like trees planted along the riverbank, bearing fruit each season. Their leaves ne never wither, and they prosper in all they do. But not the wicked. They are like worthless chaff scattered by the wind. They will be condemned at the time of judgment. Sinners will have no place among the godly. For the Lord watches over the path of the godly, but the path of, of the wicked leads to destruction. Here we have this picture of a tree planted by a river. And like any living thing, this is a, this is a picture of us. Like every, any living thing, we need input. We, we require sustenance, nourishment. And in God's system, if we look at this picture, the input is God's presence. It's a beautiful picture of a tree planted beside a river, a river that continuously flows, a river that continuously provides nourishment, um, continuously uh, uh, refreshes. If a tree is planted in the wilderness, it's dependent on rainfall that comes and goes. But here we have a picture of a tree planted beside a river that has all of its needs met because of where it's planted. The input is God's presence. So health comes through relationship with God. Revelation and wisdom comes through reading his word. The river of God's spirit is this ever-present, unwavering source of health and flourishing. And this is what God offers us as his people who choose to plant ourselves in his presence. And scripture is full of illustration of what a life planted in the spirit looks like. Psalm 92 tells us that the righteous will flourish like a palm tree. They'll grow like a cedar of Lebanon. Planted in the house of the Lord, they'll flourish in the courts of our God. They'll bear fruit in old age. They'll stay fresh and green proclaiming the Lord is upright, he's my rock, and there is no wickedness in him. John 7, 37 tells us, whoever believes in me, this is Jesus, whoever believes in Jesus, as scripture has said, rivers of living water will flow from within them. Acts 1, 8 says that we'll receive power when the Spirit comes on us. 1 Peter 1, 8 says that we'll be filled with an inexpressible and glorious joy. Matthew eleven twenty nine 29 says that we will find rest for our souls. All of these words, all of these scriptures add up to what a life in the spirit looks like when that input is constant and available to us. And it is. Our souls were made to rest in God, just as a tree was made to rest in the soil where it's planted and find its sustenance and its input there. But Psalm 1 shows us that there is a system, that there is a cycle, that God has made us to be in a certain environment in order to flourish in the way that he's designed us to. There is a way. I've been reading this book, and I would encourage you because it's, it's, um, it's changing my life, and it's 
one that we'll probably hear lots from in the next season. But it's a book by Mark Sayers. It's called uh, The Reappearing Church. And he's a pastor from Melbourne who shares this, uh, this picture from Psalm 1 is in there. But he's talking about, and he's studied how revival happens. Historically, how revival shows up. And uh, uh, he talks about how there is a way. And we know this, but we need to be reminded there is a system. Uh, because the world around you, the voices that you're tapped into, they're going to tell you that there's all kinds of ways. There's lots of different ways that you can find input. You could, you could choose your source. And if you don't pay attention, there will be lots of different streams of input coming into your life. And the world will tell you that you can kind of plant yourself wherever you want. In fact, you don't need to so much be rooted in anything outside of yourself. You're the boss. You create the system. And if you allow all kinds of sources to come into your life, just be aware that you're going to create a cesspool, that those, those sources aren't pure, that what we require to experience God's goodness and to let it come out of our lives is to be rooted planted by the source, by, by the river. There is a way. And in a toxic and destructive system, which is the world that we live in, there are other inputs. So Psalm 1 talks about how wickedness, sin, and mockery show up. If there is other sources, other ways that we're ascribing to, that there are other behaviors and attitudes that show up. A toxic system produces a plant that withers up, dries up, it dies, it, it fades away. Uh, but a flourishing life happens with the spirit. I wanted to show you a, an illustration that I quickly made, and this comes from John Ortberg, that shows us what it looks like when we try to do the work of the spirit by ourselves. Um, it's the other one. This is the good one. This is the one that probably will be familiar to you. What happens in our lives as humans is, is we'll start at the guilt, start over here on the left. We hear a message in church maybe about how our lives should be fresh and flourishing and, and how um, God's goodness is for all of us. And maybe our life doesn't feel that way. Maybe there's zero fresh. Maybe there's no flourishing. Maybe your life feels challenging and chaotic and you can't see the goodness of God in your life. We tend to feel guilty. We want to we wanna do something about it. We, we feel challenged by that. And without the Spirit of God, in our humanity, we, we try. We, we try, and then, and then we try harder. We try to do good things. We decide, okay, it's 21 days of prayer. I'm going to be praying every morning at 5 a.m. I'm setting my alarm tomorrow. I've been waking up at, at noon, but tomorrow it's going to be 5. I'm going to do this thing. Here we go. New season. And so we try. We, we make a commitment. Uh, we decide I'm not going to miss a Sunday. I am going to be in church. This is my new thing. I'm here. I'm going to find a, a small group. You know what? I'm going to start a relate group. I'm going to start my own relate group. I'm all in. We're going to try. And we make decisions based on this desire to be closer to God. Maybe that we feel a distance between us and God. And so we, we're going to do whatever we can. We're going to be as strong as we can. We're going to speak words of faith. We've got it all together. Here we go. New year, new me. And we try as hard as we can. And without the spirit, without the power and the presence of God, we will eventually experience some kind of failure. We will we'll mess up. We'll sleep past our alarm. We'll uh, feel overwhelmed. We won't show up to church. We'll back off when it comes to our commitments. And we'll get fatigued or tired. And it, fatigue shows up in different ways. Um, it attacks the body. This is the fatigue that shows up when we stay up late, perhaps. We decide we're going to get up early. We live on caffeine, all the espresso shots, maybe the Red Bull, um, and we find ourselves physically fatigued. There's also a fatigue that attacks the mind, uh, where we find that we're bombarded by information, that there's, there's too much information, there's too many decisions to make. 
we find ourselves overwhelmed with opinion. Again, back to that source question. We, we have all these thoughts and opinions coming in, and our mind gets fatigued. After a while, we don't know which thoughts to choose or which way to look. Perhaps it shows up because we're feeling emotional or overwhelmed or somebody's hurt us or, or there's disappointment, and so we push those emotions down because we're just trying to cope. But eventually, like I said before, eventually our mind becomes overwhelmed, fatigued, tired. There's also a fatigue that attacks our will where we want to do the right thing. We're like legitimately trying, but again, there's too many decisions to make. It's hard to prioritize things. We, we find that um, it's too hard to please people, perhaps. And we want to choose and we want to do the right thing, but there's a fatigue that attacks our will. And these things combine to create what's called soul fatigue. And the indicators of this, they're subtle, but I'm gonna, I'm gonna tell you, this is how it's gonna show up in your life. When your soul is overwhelmed, when your soul is fatigued, tired, things will seem to bother you more than they should. It's hard to make your mind up about simple decisions. Impulses to eat or drink or spend or crave will be harder to resist than they otherwise would. You are more likely to favor short-term gains in ways that will leave you with long-term costs. Your judgment suffers, and you have less courage. These are the questions you could ask yourself. Write these down if you have something to write down, because maybe today this isn't an issue, but perhaps it's something you'll face in the future. You can ask yourself, am I more easily irritated these days? Ask yourself and then answer honestly. Ask yourself, am I more easily discouraged these days? If the answer is yes to those, then, then we need to pay attention to what's going on in our heart, in our soul. The enemy wants you to see failure, wants you to feel overwhelmed, because his whole goal, know this, his goal is just to have you quit. That's right. That when you feel overwhelmed, you feel exhausted, rather than seek the presence of God, that you just be like, you know what, too much, I'm out, gone, bye, quit. That would be his desire and his goal. And if from the inside of you, you find instead that there's a desire for more, maybe you're not where you want to be. Maybe you can't see what you'd hope to see, but there's a desire for more on the inside of you. I want to tell you that that is a sign of health. Just as um, we know a baby is sick if they don't want to eat any longer, or in a marriage if there's no longer any interest in the other, we know that something's off, that marriage is in trouble. When there's a desire to know more, or when there's a desire to eat, that's a sign of health. And so if there's a desire on the inside of you for more, that's a good thing. And so I want to show you what God's system looks like. And so we have this other chart. Uh, at the core of a flourishing soul is the love and the peace of God, the strength of God that isn't your own, it comes from Him. So instead, what God asks of us is that we seek His presence, that we find that source, that river that is unchanging and always present, that we, that we go after and we choose to position ourselves in God's presence. And in his presence, there's fullness of joy. In his spirit, there's strength for us. In his, uh, in his power, we find what we need. We go after his presence instead. And here there's an input of peace, revelation, conviction. Holy Spirit points out things that we need to address, weeds that need to be pulled so that we can experience more of his presence. Wisdom, identity, we discover who we really are in him. And when we're in his presence, then we have the opportunity to practice. We can actually take what he's given us and we can use it. We pray and we learn how to understand and communicate with God just as we have to learn how to communicate with a child or with a spouse. How many of you know that we don't just naturally know what the other means when words come out of their mouths? Yeah. It takes some time. To, <laughs> it takes some time to understand. 
and to know what they're really saying, the intention behind the words. In the same way, we practice, we learn how to hear the voice of God. We read his word because in his word, that is his voice. We understand what he sounds like, what his message is. When we hear messages that we're not sure, God, is that you? We can compare it to the word, which gives us a good idea of how he speaks and what he sounds like. Uh, we embrace in this practice season, we embrace the temporary pain of making sacrifices, of, of showing up together, of, of getting out of our comfort zone Known to be in a relate group perhaps we embrace what feels temporarily uncomfortable because we see that it's bigger than just us and we allow God to change us and to do that work on the inside of us we choose to stay when it feels easier to go because we're trees that are planted rooted we're putting our roots down we find healing in this practice season we find healing through confession and, and that means that it, it happens with other people. We find people that we can be real with, that we can hold uh, accountable, and, and ones who will call us out. We pray together. We talk about what's really going on. We open up so that that stuff that's on the inside that I said will have to come out, it's a safe place to do that. It's the right place to do it in a company of believers who are going together and who are on this journey together. We practice together and we embrace the practices and the disciplines that shape us. We position ourselves so that God can do the work by choosing to put ourselves in a place where we can be changed from the inside out. And that's what we're going to be talking about in this next series, what those practices are, the things like uh, solitude, getting quiet before God, things like generosity, just allowing God to, to work through us, opening our hands and, and giving so that God can use us, uh, things like Sabbath, setting time aside to know God. And these practices allow God to make a pathway through the desert. We, we so often think that God's just going to remove us and put us in a new season, and yet he moves through us, and he creates pathways in us. He, he helps us move through the seasons because he's doing that work to mature us. We practice it, and it's in that place that we find growth. And, and sometimes it takes a while. Actually, I feel like it always takes a while. Doesn't it just take longer? than you think it's going to. Yeah. But all the while, God is changing us. God is renewing us. He's refreshing us. He's maturing us. He's enlarging us. He's teaching us that we're more than conquerors. Yeah, Do not judge what's happening by what you see externally. Yeah. God doesn't. He's not focused, remember, on what you're doing. He's focused on who you are, changing us from the inside out. You know what's encouraging is that Luke 4 shows us that after Jesus was baptized, he was full of the Spirit of God. He was led by the Spirit of God, and he was led into the wilderness. Jesus was into the wilderness. And, and for some of us, we, we may in the same way be led into a wilderness, full of the Spirit, led by the Spirit, because God is doing something in us. He's changing us. So don't judge by what you see. Trust that God is doing his work as we submit to how good he is. And as we see this growth, it will show up as fruit. It'll show up as good fruit that provides nourishment for others. It will show up in obvious ways that eventually other people will be able to look and see the goodness of God through your life. It will also show up in ways that aren't evident. It will show up in, in your roots going down and being deeper. But you'll know it because in those seasons that would have rattled you, when things happen that would have just shook you to the core before, all of a sudden those things come and the wind blows and storms are all around you, but your roots are so deep that it doesn't phase you. It's not messing with you any longer. And you can look and go, oh yeah, God has done something incredible because my roots are good and they're solid. And it produces this life that is flourishing. That's the goal. That's what we're always focused on, a flourishing life. That's what we want to see. The flourishing that happens, the fruit that's produced, the tree that expands, that is, is no longer for us. That's for others. Provide shade for others, nourishment for others. It allows others to see the work of God. 
one person's pursuit of God can impact nations. It is bigger than you and I. It's bigger than us. We look at what God is doing on the inside of us, but we keep our eyes on the bigger picture. That one person choosing to presence themselves by the river, to plant themselves in God's river, to choose God's way. One person choosing to pursue the presence of God and then practice practice what he's given us, put it into action, uh, demonstrate obedience to God. One person deciding to allow God to change them on the inside, allowing God to produce fruit in their lives. It just takes one decision to change a nation. Think about those who have gone before us, who've made a decision to stay, to be planted, and how that's impacted and affected our lives. This is our wonder year, really, church. This is our wonder year. We can't do a thing without the Spirit of God. We are dependent on the Spirit. We're dependent on that river. And God is not stingy with his gifts. He's not stingy with his voice. He's not holding back on us. He is leading us. And as we're asking God for more, we're willing to be transformed. God is at the same time looking for those whose hearts are toward him, just like David, those whose hearts are open, those who are willing to be obedient, those who say, God, pick me, use me, whatever it looks like, God, whatever you have for us, um, heal our land, and God, use me, work in me, change me. God isn't looking so much for just one anointed person. He's looking for an anointed church. Today in 2019, God's looking for an anointed church full of his spirit, a place where he can be at home, where his spirit can move and change and flood. That's, that's the city we see. That's the city we're praying for in this next season.